always like to get started with the current version to keep uh, everybody, to put everybody on the same page. And with Elixir 1.15, which is the current version out there, uh, the really nice thing about this release is that the best Elixir features, they actually come from Erlang OTP 26. And uh, it's nice because it means I don't have to do a lot of work. Uh, thank you, OTP team. And it's nice because they're really great features. So for example, uh, for a long period of time, people on Windows would complain about the, uh, the, the shell, the terminal, the IX experience. And that has been pretty much solved with OTP 26. Uh, the compiler team has done a lot of new binary optimizations. We had like to slightly rewrite our code and some things uh, like the base module in Elixir is like twice faster. Fantastic as well. And one of the things that, oops, that was one click too many. And one of the things that are also in OTP 26, and this was a contribution from the Elixir team, is code path caching and pruning. And uh, that's what I want to focus in particular when talking about Elixir 1.15, because if you have a large Elixir application, uh, this change is going to be very meaningful, and I want to explain why. So in both Erlang and Elixir, compiling code often requires loading code. So for example, both of them have behavior. So if you say, hey, I implement this behavior, the, so I implement the gen server behavior. The module gen server needs to be loaded so you know what callbacks that module defines so you can check you are implementing all of them. Um, in Erlang, we have parse transforms, which needs to transform our code, so we need to load that code. Elixir has macros and metaprogramming, uh, which are used uh, quite more ex extensively than parse transforms, and those also need to require code. But uh, in particular for Elixir, after we compile all of your code, uh, what we do is that we go through your code. So after all of your code is compiled, all the modules, we go through those modules, and we try to find uh, functions that you may be calling that they are not actually defined because the function name is wrong or the module does not exist. We try to find deprecated functions, and this also has to load code. And, load coding, and loading code here means that we need to go through the file system, find the byte code for that module, and bring that into memory and start asking questions to, uh, about that, that module, about that uh, piece of byte code. And it's not only compilation, right? Booting your application requires loading code because when you're building your application, you're starting a supervision tree, and that supervision tree needs to start mod needs to start processes that runs codes in modules, and you have to load those modules. Uh, running tests certainly requires loading code because you need to load the module that you're going to test. And you may run tests in parallel as well, right? So what can happen is that you start running your tests, and now you have like two different uh, test files uh, trying to load this, the same module that they are going to use as part of their testing. And what can happen now is that you have to deal with this situation, right? You have to do the situation where, hey, I have like two tests running at the same time, uh, two Erlang virtual machine processes, and they need to load the code. And the way this is solved is that load, uh, loading code happens in the code server process. So this is an internal process that's run inside Erlang OTP. And it, every time you need to load code, you go to this process and say, hey, load code for me. And when I say that, this may set some alarms in your head. You're like, wait, wait, wait. So if we have a single process loading code, it means that this can be a bottleneck. Because if I have a lot of things trying to load code at the same time, they, now, they all now have to wait on this process. And if you thought that, that's correct. The code server is a bottleneck. So in OTP 25, the previous OTP version, um, the way it would work is that you know, every time you start your project, it will add all, all the OTP applications. So Erlang OTP, the standard library for Erlang, comes with like 30, 35 applications. So each of those uh, have a path in the file system with all their beam files. So each of those applications, they will be added to the load path. So OTP has about 30 to 35. Elixir has six. And then all dependencies in your project. So if you have like 40 dependencies, all together you're going to have like 80 load paths you need to, you would have to go through to, to, to find a module. And loading a module, exactly that, requires traversing the load path, okay? Which makes, for example, checking a non-existing module very expensive. So imagine that you want to say, look, uh, conditionally, I want to check if this module is defined, because if, if it's not defined, I want to 
do this this other way, that can be very expensive because every time you do this check, you may need to go for the load server and now do 80 file system lookups and you'll find out that none of them define that module. And you're like, okay, it's false. I'm going to do the other thing. So you don't want to be checking if modules are loaded or defined in, in hot code paths in your code for sure, right? And under concurrent load, it becomes a bottleneck. And the more dependencies you have, right, the more likely it will become a bottleneck. The more cores you have, potentially the more likely it will become a bottleneck too. So in Erling OTP 26, what we did is that we contributed granular caching per path. So now when you add a dependency, okay, you can say, uh, you can say I want to cache this thing. And you don't have to do it, right? As we'll see, Elixir is doing this automatically for us. And the cache is computed lazily. So instead of going and say, hey, I'm adding this dependency with a bunch of bin modules. Let me go and figure out what are the bin files in there. We don't do that when you add the path. What we do is that the first time you try to look in that module, if that module is cached, then we figure out everything that is there and leave it cached. Okay? And you, you can look at this and you can say, OK, this is still ON. Like I still need to go through all the paths. But it doesn't matter if it's ON if we made it like three, t uh, three orders of magnitude faster, right? Like if it's super fast now, if we can cache and we don't have to go through the file system, yeah, I still need to go for every directory, but now that's super, super quick because all I need to do is to check for a key in a map, okay? And we have numbers to, 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 to back it up. Uh, so this is the time for compiling an Elixir uh, application. This is Livebook application, which uh, Chris was talking about. So uh, Livebook is an Elixir application, and it has about 200 files when we measure this and 40 dependencies. So if you consider the 40 dependencies from the application, the 30 to 35 from OTP, and uh, plus Elixir, we are talking about 80 code, eight, uh, 80 entries in the, in the load path, okay? And in Elixir 1.15, OTP 25, all right, we can see that to compile this project, all the files from scratch took about 6.4 uh, seconds. And then just going to Elixir 1.15, but still OTP 25, we were able to get like a 7 to 8% improvement. And the reason for this, the, the reason why we're, we're able to get this improvement is because Elixir 1.15 does both the code path caching, which we are going to see the results, but it does code path pruning. And the idea with code path pruning is, well, if Erlang OTP has 30 to 35 applications, in practice, you're going to use what? Like 20, 30% of them, right? So what we do is that, oh, if you're not using this OTP application, we are going to remove it from your code path. And just removing the applications that you don't use from OTP already gave like that improvement, all right? That's 7 to 8 percent improvement. But once you go to Elixir 1.15 and OTP 26, now you also use code path caching, and that brought uh, a 10 percent improvement on top of that. And the cool thing about this is that this is going to depend, once again, on how big your application is, how many dependencies you have, and how many cores you have in your machine. So we have heard teams saying that compiling code now is twice faster for them. Some even said that they got a three times improvement to compilation times, which is always amazing. And once again, oh, booting our application needs to load code. So if we measure the time to boot Livebook, again, from 1.15 to OTP 25, it was taking one second. And now uh, by going to Elixir 1.15, still OTP 25, because of code path pruning, we got a 10%. And then if we go to Alex 0.15 to OTP 26, all together, that's a 30% improvement. And this is going to matter every time, like you run a test, for example, right? Um, so everything, you're we're going to get feedback much quicker. So this is very exciting. I'm very excited about those improvements um, because as companies start to build large and large applications uh, in, uh, for Elixir, compilation time may start to become a concern, and this uh, gets us a lot of leeway. Um, but that's all great news, but the code server is still a bottleneck, right? As they say, like, you never solve a bottleneck, you just postpone it, right? You just make it happen later. And so there are a lot of things, like the code server still looks up the file system, the code server still centralizes code loading, the code server still calls Earl Primloader, so this is another module that is also backed by a single process. So there are still bottlenecks in there, and there are ongoing discussions with the OTP team to address this. 
All right, let's talk about what is coming next. So Alex 0.16, the upcoming version, uh, it has two important features that I want to show you today. And you're going to notice that throughout the years, like the Elixir releases, they have been getting smaller and smaller. Like part of the reason is because all the great work happens uh, within Erling OTP and within the Elixir community, right? So Elixir is kind of uh, comfortably in the middle. So, but there are still things that I think you're going to be very excited about. So the first one is improved compiler diagnostics. So in Elixir 1.16, when you get an exception, now we are going to include a snippet showing exactly, for example, a syntax error, showing exactly where the error is. Uh, if you get like, a, I like, really like this one, a mismatch at the limiter. So imagine that you start a list and then you uh, close it improperly because or you forgot something we say exactly like, hey, this is what we open, this is what you forget to close. If you have multiple lines, these we show the snippet across multiple lines. So very convenient to help you find where that uh, pesky syntax error is. And that's not only about like syntax errors. Like uh, a lot of the compiler diagnostics, like warnings and errors, now they are going to show the snippet as well. And if we have precise information, like they span, like, oh, this is a variable. I know exactly where the variable is. We are going to underline that. And uh, if you don't have the whole thing, if you don't have like the, the span, we just underline the whole thing. And this was a feature contributed by Vinicius Müller. So thank you very much for those contributions. I think uh, people are going to really enjoy uh, those improvements to the language. And the other thing that is coming with Elixir 1.16 is that we have a revamp documentation. And uh, Elixir is often praised by the quality of the documentation. And uh, what we decided to do for this release is to improve a lot of things around the documentation, not the API documentation that we did not make a lot of changes there, but everything around, like guides, tutorials, cheat sheets. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples, right? So one, one of the things that we did is that if you wanted to get started with Elixir, um, we had a separate getting started on the website because when I wrote that getting started guide, xdoc did not even exist. So, and now I decide, okay, let's bring the whole Elixir getting started. Here are all the, the chapters on the sidebar here. Let's bring that to the Elixir official documentation because now we get cross-linking, we get uh, search, full text search, auto-completion, you get all the goodies. Also what we did is that uh, there was um, a, a work by uh, Lucas Veggi and Marco Tullio Valente in cataloging and documenting uh, code smells, as we call them in literature, code smells in Elixir. And we've brought that into the, into the Elixir documentation as well. So now we have extensive documentation on anti-patterns. So we are calling them anti-patterns on the documentation. So you can find anti-patterns, things that you should avoid in your code, okay? Related to code, related to design, related to processes, related to metaprogramming. And the idea here is not only to show Elixir developers like, hey, this is how you should do things, but also to have some documentation on what you should avoid, what you should not be doing. And we explain exactly why you should not be doing that, what you should be worried about, if that applies to you and that's the case, how you should solve those problems. Another cool feature in XDoc is cheat sheets. So you can generate like quick summaries about what you want to do in your code. And we started, in co we started adding cheat sheets to the Elixir documentation. So here is, we have one cheat sheet right now, which is for the enum module. So for Erlang developers, you can think of the enum module in Elixir like the lists module in Erlang. So it has a really large like surface API, right? There are a lot of functions in there, and sometimes it's hard for you to find what you want to do. With the difference that the enum module in Elixir works with a variety of collections. And the idea of the cheat sheet is exactly so we can provide like quick examples of all the functions that we have uh, in the enum module. So if you are trying to quickly find something that you want to do, you can just scan through this. Uh, maybe you can even print it, put it on your wall. We'll see. Right, so, uh, so we started with the num cheat sheet one. If you have ideas of other cheat sheets that we could have in the Elixir documentation, open up an issue or a thread on the forum, and we'll be very glad to discuss and listen to ideas. And something else 
that we have that we added to documentation is Diagram. So uh, Xdoc support, supports Mermaid. You can add, you can say, hey, Xdoc, I want to use Mermaid. So they're starting adding Mermaid diagrams. So this we borrowed from uh, the Erlang OTP uh, documentation has a very similar diagram. We borrowed that. Now we have that in Argent Server page as well. But we also added a bunch of diagrams showing the internals, right? So like, for example, I have a Jun server. What happens when you start the Jun server? What that's going to call? Oh, that's going to call init on your module, right? And you should return one of those things. So now we have the diagram showing how this communication worked. We added that to the Jun server. We added that to supervisor. So now you can understand how the supervisor is going to initialize our process. So again, like this was all in written text. Right? But now we have the diagram. It's a very nice way to summarize everything and give you, bring a different perspective. All right, and that's pretty much it right? for uh, Elixir 1.16. It may be like our uh, smallest release ever, which in a very weird way, it's very nice to say. Um, all right, but the big thing that if if I don't talk about it, people are going to ask about me anyway, so I have to talk about it, is that we have been researching, uh, we have been working on bringing a type system to Elixir. So uh, Guillaume was here presenting yesterday. If you missed his talk, you can go back, you can watch it. So we have a PhD scholarship to research and develop a gradual type system for Elixir. Right, so Guillaume, he was presenting yesterday, and the project uh, is led uh, by Giuseppe Castagna, and I'm participating on it as well. And the thing is, like, if you want to, I consider this to be like a classic, like, research and development project, right? And and as a research and development project, what we need to do is that if we want Elixir is an existing programming language, as we all know, so what we need to do is that if we want to bring a type system to Elixir we need to see how well we, Elixir is going to fit within that type of system. So we need to model Elixir semantics. We need to get everything that you can do with Elixir and model that using the type system. And the type system in particular is a set theoretic uh, type system. So we have to do that. And the thing is, if it doesn't fit well, it's probably, oh, that type system is not going to, to to be a good fit. And Annette, she was also presenting yesterday that they are doing similar work uh, for Erlang, right? So we want to have a, a lot of fit between uh, the programming language and the type system, but it's unlikely that we are going to find a type system that can express everything that Elixir can do and everything that Erlang can do. So we are going to find errors of incompatibility. And when we find those errors, we need to make decisions. We need to say, oh, Maybe that's bad code. Nobody should be writing that. But maybe what we need to do is that we need to improve the theory. We need to augment the theory, the theory whatever necessary. Um, and then if we do augment the theory, we want to publish our results and collect feedback on them. And that's exactly what we did. So we've gone through all these steps. There is a paper called the Design Principles of the Elixir Type System. And the main ideas that we have to develop uh, in order to improve the fit between Elixir and set theoretic types, uh, there were three main ideas, which I'm going to summarize. Look at the paper for all the details. So the first one is, we model guards, we model everything that you can do with guards and patterns with set theoretic types because guards and patterns, they are essential to Elixir and Erlang developers. So we need to make sure that we have a very good matching there. We also introduced this idea that we call gradual typing with strong arrows. I wrote more about this uh, on the Elixir blog as well. There is also on the paper. But the idea, it's... Uh, this may not be a good way of describing it, but I think it's the best way to send the, to to give to to pass the idea uh, to, to you, which is to say, imagine that we get the idea that we have in Dialyzer, where we try to find bugs in your code without necessarily needing input from you, and we got that idea, those concepts there, and we're able to embed that within a type system. And the reason why this is good is because, yeah, we can find bugs in your code that you did not add the types. But if you add a type signature, then it behaves like a static type system. So it's kind of like, well, how can we help the developer the way that uh, Dialyzer sometimes help us find bugs, right? but within an actual type system? So I, I hope that uh, uh, Giuseppe and Guillaume are not going to murder me after this explanation. But I think it's a, it, the idea is there. And we also had, oops, another one click too many. And we also had to unify records and dictionaries, right? Because if you look at maps 
uh, in Elixir and Erlang, we use them with two different purposes, right? So one is that we use them as a record, which means that we know that all the fields, they are defined up front. But we also use them as dictionaries where, you know, we're like, oh, I'm going to put integers into these, or I'm going to put strings that I don't know what the values are. And though in, in, in typing literature, those are usually modeled as two different things, but in here we have a single data structure. So uh, there was work in providing a type theory that allows us to type maps, uh, to be more precise. And then we announced um, a couple months ago that since we are done with research, our work has moved from research into development. So when we talk about development, uh, we have started now, starting the second semester uh, of this year. And our goal is to focus on patterns, guards, and language constructions. Our idea is that we don't want to, we don't, we're still not sure if the type system is going to work. So what we want to do is that we want to implement the type system behind the scenes, get information from patterns, guards, and other language constructions like accessing a map field, and try to find bugs in your code. So no visible changes to the language. So we can focus on improving the type system performance, improving the error message. So we are going in this direction, and then Annette was presenting um, yesterday that they're exploring a different direction for Merlin, where they're starting from the type specs and see how well that can fit within a set theoretic type system. So it's nice that we are approaching the problem from different directions and we'll be able to share insights. And uh, finally, I want to announce that uh, the work uh, the development work of the type system uh, that we have started, it's only made possible because it's a partnership between the CNRS, which is the biggest uh, scientific research institution in Europe and remote. And it, it is being sponsored by Fresha, Starfish, and Dashbit. So if you're looking for like Elixir positions, you should definitely reach out to those companies. And last slide is the usual disclaimers. Uh, I have a new one today, which is all of our work applies to Erlang because you know, uh, the semantics of Erlang and Elixir, they are pretty much the same, so that's really nice. And, but the important disclaimer is that Elixir may still not get a type system, right? This work, there are still things that can go wrong. We are very happy with the results so far. We are hap very happy with the research results. But things can still go wrong. We may still be unhappy with the final result. And we say, OK, we tried. We did our best. And I think that's the, the important message here. We are being very careful on each step that we make. We are being very deliberate in our decisions. So when we get at the end, regardless if it worked or not, or not, we'll know exactly why uh, we'll be able to learn what we could have done better or what we can improve because, uh, yeah, we are being very intentional about all of this. So that's it. Thank you very much.